I was looking online to see if there was any Terrence McKenna biography videos and I was so surprised to find out that there aren't any. So I figured why not be the person to make it. Today we'll be talking about the life and ideas of Terrence McKenna, the most legendary figure in the psychedelic community. The 1940s were arguably some of the darkest and deadliest days in human history. We were straddled with the world war, nuclear weapons, and the rise of fascism. But in this dark time, something else happened. In 1943, during the height of World War II, Albert Hoffman discovered the effects of LSD. This would plant the seeds for the psychedelic revolution of the mind. Just three years later, in 1946, our protagonist was born. Terence McKenna was born November 16th, 1946, in a small mining town called Paonia, Colorado. He was the first of two children, including his awesome brother, Dennis McKenna. The McKennas had Irish ancestry on their father's side and they grew up Catholic. Terence developed an interest in fossil hunting and geology as a kid. This would be the beginning of his scientific appreciation for beauty and nature. It was during his childhood in the 1950s that he developed an affinity for all things strange. Reading things like weird tales, the book of knowledge, and creature features. By the time he was 9 or 10, he was performing an earnest form of ceremonial magic at home drawing pentagrams while at the same time serving as an altar boy at the church. Terence would say later in his life that culture is not your friend. One of his first brush-ups with culture occurred when he was 12 years old. He said that where he grew up, you weren't considered a real man until you shot an elk. So he went with his father and ended up shooting an elk and he felt very frightened and uncomfortable with the whole thing. This is probably one of the first times that Terence felt that culture was not his friend. He cites nature and the pursuit of beauty as what formed his interests. As he entered puberty, he had an entire rocket phase where he wanted to be a rocket scientist, he was an amateur rocketeer, and his interests in rockets are what led him to science fiction, what Terence called a proto-psychedelic drug. Sci-fi has mind-expanding effects because it allows you to imagine what is possible. It gives you permission to imagine far out things. When he was 14 years old, he learned that his mom and the librarian had conspired to keep him from reading a particular book. That scandalous book was Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. As any of us know, when you ban a book or music, it has the exact opposite effect as what's intended. And so a new burning desire filled Terence to find out what this book was and read it. And he took it the next step further and read every book that was written by this author, Aldous Huxley. Eventually, this led him to the book the Doors of Perception, where Aldous Huxley describes his mystical experience had on mescaline. This book was written in the 50s and it's responsible for the beginning of the psychedelic counterculture of the 60s in more ways than one. And the idea of having a hallucination really intrigued Terence. It was his quest for beauty that led him to psychedelics and hallucinations. After reading about Aldous Huxley's mystical experience, Terence dug even deeper, reading the literature that came before that, like William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience, and other stories that were available at the time. This is the same year he would read articles about psychedelics, like the famous Life magazine article called Seeking the Magic Mushroom. This is also around the same time where he discovered the book Psychology and Alchemy by Carl Jung. This would be extremely formative to Terence's ideas. And I can assure you this is not a book that your typical 14 year old is reading. Terence McKenna credits his speaking abilities to this time in his life, where he said he would use storytelling to distract the bullies until the bell rang to avoid getting beat up. It was somewhere around this time that he discovered cannabis and he became a lifelong heavy user. As you can tell, he was not extremely well adapted to his 
hyper conservative hometown in Colorado. So at the age of 16, he moved to California to finish high school in his town north of LA. Somewhere around this time, he read newspaper articles about using morning glory seeds to trip. He had his first psychedelic trip on morning glory seeds, and it wasn't super powerful, but it was enough to let him know that there was something there worth pursuing. In the mid 60s, Terence McKenna began using LSD. Before discovering mushrooms and DNT, his secret cocktail was LSD and hashish. Terence said, Before I went to the Amazon, that was what I discovered that really convinced me that you could get somewhere was take a bunch of LSD and then smoke great hash on top of that and really crazy things do go on. He moved to the Bay Area of California in 1967, right before his freshman year of college. This was at the peak time and location of the hippie movement, 1967, San Francisco's Summer of Love. These were times full of political protest and advocacy. These issues would shape McKenna's view on authority for years to come. He enrolled at UC Berkeley and he joined an experimental wing of the college called Tussman Experimental College. It was ran by a single professor who was allowed to design his own curriculum. This is where the early inklings of his speaking career would appear. I'll read you a quick quote that Dennis said about this time period. He said, Terence gained a modest campus following as well, as people began to gather at his flat, already filling up with his first library of esoterica, western magic, and eastern mysticism, just to hear his freaky pot-fueled raps. Unlike most people who get high and grow quiet, cannabis only made him more articulate, more talkative, and more able to weave his enrapturing narratives. It was during his college years that he was first exposed to DMT. His first encounter with the machine elves left him appalled to say the least. Dennis McKenna said this about their encounters with DMT. DMT seemed to us to be more than just another psychedelic. Anyone who has experienced DMT will confirm that the effects have a consistently science fictionish quality, replete with apparent encounters with non-human intelligences, strange machinery, or other artifacts of uncertain purpose. The smoked DMT trip is like taking a fast ride on a neon-lit roller coaster through a hyperspatial cosmic carnival. Terence studied art history and then switched majors. He graduated in 1969 with a bachelor's in science in conservation and ecology. Did I get that right? Yes. Big brain, big brain. While he was studying art history, he came across a pre-Tibetan tradition called Bone, a folk religion that seemed to have visionary shamanic practices. He felt a peculiar resonance to their artworks, feeling some kind of connection to the psychedelic space. I think the intricate mandalas that Terence saw in this art reminded him of the DMT visions. It was also in 1969 that Terence McKenna wrote his first book, Crypto Rap. Apparently, he went to an island and wrote the whole book sober while he was growing his cannabis plants. And once they were fully grown, he smoked it and read his book and decided that he hated all of it. And he scrapped it and rewrote it from scratch. The book was never published, but there are small segments of it in Eric Davis's book, High Weirdness, which I highly recommend. After college, Terence spent time in Nepal where he continued to study Tibetan shamanism and he collected butterflies professionally. He also made ends meet by smuggling hash to the US. One of his shipments was seized by the US Customs and he figured he was a wanted man. So he stopped doing that and left. Terence also traveled Southeast Asia and South America visiting ruins and he also had a brief teaching stint in Japan teaching English. The events that transpired next would go on to shape the man we now know as Terence McKenna, the experiment at La Trurera. The McKenna brothers' DMT experiences were so strong that they became increasingly convinced that 
DMT was actually some kind of portal to an alien dimension that was very much a real place. They thought that if this was true, it would be the greatest scientific discovery ever made. After the death of their mother in 1970, Terence and Dennis began to pursue what they called the secret, this idea of DMT as a portal to another dimension. They chose to travel to the Amazon in search for a DMT containing snuff called Ukuhe. It was used by the Witoto people and in their accounts, they describe encounters with little men, which I think Terence likened to the machine elves. The snuff was an orally active form of DMT, and this was before it was known that ayahuasca is an orally active form of DMT. The reason they sought this out is because their smoked DMT revelations were so short-lived. They thought that if they had an orally active form, it would allow them more time to explore this dimension. That way they could conduct a more thorough survey of this other realm. But in their search for Ukuhe, they discovered psilocybin mushrooms growing in abundance on the cow patties in the fields surrounding them. What started for them as a recreation while they were pursuing Ukuhe quickly came to the forefront. Eventually, they realized that psilocybin was this perfect long-term portal to the tryptamine spaces that they had been looking for. On top of that, they didn't pack that much food, so they began to consume these mushrooms regularly and in very large doses. They quickly reorganized their priorities of the trip thanks to this discovery. They began to download information from what they called the mushroom teacher, mostly through Dennis. The info they were downloading were the protocols for an experiment of some kind. It's kind of hard to explain. I would recommend reading True Hallucinations to hear them fully describe it, but Dennis also kind of encapsulates it in this quote, so I'm gonna read to you what he says the experiment is. The protocol were a blueprint for transforming our own bodies into an artifact composed of both matter and mind and that would respond to telepathic commands and was capable of doing literally anything that could be imagined. This psychobiological artifact, which we came to call the eschaton, had much in common with other conceptions of super technologies that have long haunted the human collective imagination, such as UFOs, time machines, and in earlier centuries, the Philosopher's Stone or Magic Mirrors. The Eschaton was to be all of that and much more. It was to be the ultimate technological artifact that would transcend all technologies while ending time and history in the process. Our aspirations were as inflated as our manic delusions. So they were going to use plants, fungi, and sound to turn their own bodies into the Philosopher's Stone while tripping balls, essentially. When they carried out the experiment, which involved Dennis McKenna kind of humming to the sound of that DMT hum that you hear when you're tripping at high doses, and nothing really happened, except they saw an image of the Earth from space on one of the caps of the mushrooms. The mushroom teacher assured them that they had succeeded in creating the stone, but it wasn't going to be immediate. This is going to be spread out over time. This is also where Dennis McKenna got stuck in this kind of long-term cosmic consciousness. You could call it a psychotic break or a shamanic initiation, but basically over the span of weeks, Dennis McKenna, his consciousness was spread across the universe like some kind of perfectly spread PV and J across the entire cosmos, and his identity was that size. But it wasn't just temporary, it was staying. And over time, his consciousness began to dilate back down to that of a normal ego. And much to the dismay of their friends, Terence insisted that they ride this thing out instead of 
immediately flying back to a mental institution. This ended up being the right move and Dennis recovered. This is also the time where Terence would receive what would be the conceptual seeds of his time wave zero theory. The idea that different parts of history are interconnected and resonate and interact with each other in a non-linear way. Time wave can be seen as a diviner like the I Ching, mapping out the subjective experiences of these resonances in time. Time. We'll talk about time wave theory a little bit more later in the video. The most valuable gift they received during this whole trip was the mushroom spores themselves. They collected the spores and brought them home, developing an easy method for growing them in mason jars. They wanted other people to experience these mind-boggling dimensions that they had encountered in the mushroom realm. They released a book on how to grow mushrooms called psilocybin the magic mushroom growers guide and they released it under the pseudonyms ot os which is terence and on oeric which was dennis they adapted methods that were in another book used to grow edible mushrooms at home but used it for psilocybin because of their methods people began growing mushrooms at home and improving their technique, making mushrooms more widely available and cheap. It was the first time that an ordinary person could produce a powerful psychedelic in their own home without the need for technology or chemicals like you would for something like LSD. It's through these book sales and what Terence McKenna would call consulting that he made his living in the 70s. I can only speculate that consulting means he sold the mushrooms that he grew. In the early 1980s, Terence McKenna began talking about his ideas in various lectures, workshops, and radio interviews. Late 1982 is when a set of cassettes was released with some of his earliest recordings, with titles like New and Old Maps of Hyperspace, Psilocybin in the Sands of Time, Ayahuasca Songs of Peru. Many of Terence McKenna's future friends would get to know his work through the circulation of these cassette tapes, including people like Ralph Abraham and Rupert Sheldrake, a mathematician and a biologist who would form this little group with Terence who would have hours long and very stimulating conversations, which they called the trialogues. Well, I can't wait to see this laboratory of clarity unfold before me tonight. I was hanging out of <laughs> And as all nonsense is dispelled, as the scalpel of reason is, is, is brought out by Terence. <clears throat> Yes, well, it is an ambiguous enterprise and fraught with contradiction, but forward, ever forward. <laughs> One of the most frequent stops on Terence's lecture tours were Big Sur and the Esalen Institute, where he spoke over a hundred times, and it's still around today. Terence McKenna quickly became known in the psychedelic counterculture because of his dazzling oratory and nasally alien voice with an Irish sing-songy lilt. It seems appropriate to hear about such far-out subjects with such an alien-sounding voice. Terence was as well-read as he was well-spoken, and his vast library allowed him to weave together vastly different subjects into an enrapturing narrative and show the interconnectedness of it all. What had started as his way to distract bullies and avoid getting beat up was now his vocation and calling. He had a compelling way of speaking and commanded the attention of anyone who heard him, in addition to being an amazing storyteller. His brother Dennis says that he's the type of person who could read a phone book out loud and they would love it. Here's a quote about Terence's speaking from Paul Krasner. In person, he is spontaneously charming and effortlessly witty. He loves language, and though he's glib without being speedy, he chooses his words carefully. He communicates with the precision of an architect and the passion of a poet, speaking in a friendly, entertaining twang. He is, in short, a Mr. Rogers for grown-ups. In the neighborhood he welcomes you to explore is your own inner space. And like Dennis McKenna said earlier in the video, cannabis only made him more articulate, more talkative, and more able to weave 
his enrapturing narratives. Cannabis was a staple in Terence's life and it is part of what enabled him to weave all of these ideas together. One of the principal characteristics of cannabis consciousness is this ability to grow links and connections to different domains of knowledge already within your head. Williams Novak said that cannabis could possibly be acting as a magnet, drawing all of these various ideas together from different parts of the mind and perhaps elsewhere. As the 80s gave way to the 90s, Terence McKenna found himself speaking at raves, which he embraced as part of the counterculture and what he called the archaic revival. It was in the early 90s where Terence McKenna released a lot of books in succession, including Food of the Gods, True Hallucinations, and archaic revival. Throughout the 80s and 90s, thousands of hours of Terence McKenna's talks were recorded either professionally or bootlegged. He is also often sampled in music. Even my band used a Terence McKenna sample in a song. Thanks to all of these websites and their archives, including YouTube, the next generation of psychonauts can enjoy Terence McKenna's beautiful words and ideas and get inspiration. And Terence haunts the internet like an immortal cyber being. In this way, he's still very much with us. For much of Terence's adult life, he was married to Kathleen Harrison and they had two kids together. They also worked together on a project called Botanical Dimensions, which was dedicated to preserving and growing psychoactive plants from all around the world. Terence mainly advocated for the responsible use of psychedelics to explore our own minds and to decondition us from 10,000 years of bad behavior, as he would call it. More specifically, he advocated for plant-based psychedelics, with the exception of DMT, but mostly spoke about things like psilocybin and ayahuasca. He was the one who popularized the term heroic dose, which I think he may have gotten from Joseph Campbell's idea of the heroic journey. A heroic dose, as Terence prescribes, is five dried grams of mushrooms alone in silent darkness. The idea behind a high dose is you can't resist what message the mushroom has for you. It shows you the utter strangeness of our universe in a long form DMT trip. He did also express the need for responsible use, which I know does not get emphasized as much as a heroic dose, where he warned people to build up to that experience and know that there are risks involved. Another one of his ideas is he proposed that the earth has a mind and a spirit of its own, a collective of the whole called the Gaian mind. He suggested that the plant psychedelics like psilocybin and ayahuasca were the facilitators of contact between individual humans and this Gaian mind or the world over soul. One of his most famous ideas is just his description of machine elves. He describes encountering entities on DMT which he described as self-dribbling jeweled basketballs and self-transforming machine elves. He said that these entities would create impossible objects, singing them into existence. And these objects would spawn even more objects. And these entities would jump into his chest. He never really settled on any theory of what these entities might be, but he did feel certain that he was in some kind of ecology of souls. He also talked about a psychedelic version of the panspermia theory, which is the idea that spores can survive the harsh environment of space, and so psilocybin mushroom spores could be propagating throughout the universe and finding different creatures, like in our case humans, to create a symbiosis with. He also claimed that the mushroom can speak and that this was a unique property of psilocybin versus other psychedelics. He even recorded some of the dialogue that he had and wrote it down with what he described as a mushroom intellecty. Terence was the original advocate of the stoned ape theory, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard, but if you haven't, it's the idea that psilocybin mushrooms played an integral role in our human evolution going way back millions of years to our hominid ancestors and that 
the fact that they ate these mushrooms gave them evolutionary benefits. It could have something to do with the time period where our brains practically tripled in size, which is something that is still not fully understood by science. And it could also have been playing a role all along from way back then up until our development of language and art. So his idea is basically that it's been a symbiotic partner with humanity forever. He was also a proponent of what he called the archaic revival. It's a way that the modern sick reality can heal itself by reverting to archaic values of the tribal days. And you can do that through music and art and piercings and tattoos, anything that brings us back to what he perceived as a golden age. During the experiment at La Trurera, Terence McKenna received downloads of information having to do with the nature of the way time flows. In using the I Ching, he developed a mathematical formula based on the ebb and flow of novelty in the universe. Novelty meaning new and combinations of things that have never been seen before and new levels of complexity. He argued that the universe itself is a novelty creating engine. I'm gonna read you some quotes about time wave theory just so you can grasp it a little more. So he said, the essence of the theory is that existence emerges from the clash of two forces, not good and evil, but habit and novelty. Habit is entropic, repetitious, conservative. Novelty is creative, disjunctive, progressive. In all processes at any scale, you can see these two forces grinding against each other. You can also see that novelty is winning. As novelty increases, so does complexity. From the Big Bang on, McKenna elaborated, the universe has been complexifying and each level of complexity achieved becomes the platform for a further ascent into complexity. So fusion in early stars creates heavy elements in carbon, that becomes a basis for molecular chemistry. That becomes a basis for photobionic life. That becomes a basis for eukaryotic stuff. That becomes a basis for multicellular organisms. That for higher animals. That for culture. That for machine symbiosis. And on and on. Putting all of this information into a graph created a fractal. Terence mapped out the I Ching and developed this formula and he put it into a mathematical formula that you could put into the computer and produce a graph. He noticed that this graph was fractal, where a small part of the wave would look like a big part of the wave. And these were the ways that he would extrapolate these resonances in time. So let's say you took a tiny part of the wave that was uh, this past week, and you notice that it shares the same pattern on the big part of the wave of the fall of the Roman Empire. And this is the theory that led to all of this 2012 end of the world business. A lot of people who heard about the end of the world of 2012 probably didn't know that Terence McKenna was behind a lot of that. It had to do with his time wave kind of predicting this singularity point that also roughly coincided with the Mayan calendar and because they were a mushroom using culture he thought those went together. I'm not sure I understand this totally, but I tried the best I can to piece it together. Which, to be clear, the Mayan calendar, which he got this from, didn't say it was going to be the end of the world. It's just where their calendar resets. So time wave was never really taken seriously and it's still considered pseudoscience. But I happen to think that novelty is occurring and increasing complexity. He was onto something about this novelty stuff. If you look at the advancement of life and evolution and the advancement of our technology, if you look how sports have been changing over the last hundred years and music and art, you will see that we are gaining novelty and complexity. We're always recombining things and advancing things. So even if this isn't some inherent quality built into the universe, it may be part of human culture or at least the earth. Terence McKenna also incorporated themes of alchemy and Gnosticism into his work and he often compared shamanism to the process of the alchemists creating the Philosopher's Stone. In fact, he claimed that 
shamanism had actually found the stone that the alchemists were seeking. We have come to understand that the work of alchemy was not about the transmutation of crude metals into gold, but was in fact a kind of dance of the imagination in which the psychological complexes within the alchemist were mingled in an amalgam with chemical processes, creating a kind of mythology of matter. He also talked extensively about UFOs. He kind of took the Carl Jung approach of calling it basically a collective psychic projection into some kind of future wholeness that we might achieve someday. He also connected this idea of the UFO and the Philosopher's Stone to eschatology, which means the last thing. At this end point of history, this eschaton, this last thing, this UFO, he would often switch names of what this object could be. It would usher in a new reality, ending history as we know it. He also spoke of this object at the end of time as a strange attractor, as opposed to the past pushing us towards the future. It's some thing that already exists in our future that's drawing us towards it. I think that's a very fascinating idea. He also joined Timothy Leary in embracing virtual technologies, computers, and the internet. He spoke about ideas like virtual reality and memes. He was one of the first people to talk about the importance of spreading memes. So I think he would be pleasantly surprised to see how prevalent memes are in our culture. He also talked about the need to have a more perfect language, and he spoke about the limitations of having a sound-based language. He often called them small mouth noises, and I feel this way a lot too, where I feel like I'm trying to express something and I just feel like this frustrated caveman grunting. He said that an improved language would actually shift the senses and be more visually based. That way if I could just project some hologram right here in front of me, you would clearly see what I mean and there's no ambiguity, no translation in your head necessary. That way you can be more readily understood. He thought that computer animation would play a role in this more perfect language. This is a good example of how Marshall McLuhan influenced his ideas. In May of 1999, Terence McKenna came home from a long lecturing tour. He was suffering from a horrible headache. He then experienced multiple brain seizures and managed to get an ambulance. Then he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of brain cancer. To his surprise, the doctor described his tumor in terms of a fruiting body and a mycelia that was spreading to other tissues in his brain. This is language typically reserved for mushrooms. His prognosis was that he had six months to live if he had treatment. He suspected that a lifetime of exotic drug use was to blame, but they couldn't confirm that. When the news of his illness got out, he was bombarded by an outpouring of love from the psychedelic community. He was getting over a thousand emails a day. He received gamma knife surgery and experimental gene therapy, which did buy him some time and at first was looking very promising. Unfortunately, his tumor came back with a vengeance and it was soon deemed inoperable. The one benefit to all of this is he did have a lot of time to reflect on his death and get all of his business in order. Death itself is so far beyond ordinary experience. The threat of dying doesn't really move you toward understanding it. Death is the great mystery around which religions are built. And being able to say, I know what it is, I know how it works, is the way you start a congregation and uh, get a little community going. Um, I would say the big surprise for me was that I'm not afraid of death the way I thought I would be. It's just such an intellectual question mark that you just move to the next page uh, because there's nothing to be said about death except that it seems to last rather a long time. <laughs> he often said that psychedelics were a practice for death. So if anyone was ready for the great beyond, it would be him. Reflecting at the end of his life, he said, it's all about love. 
making someone else's existence just a little easier. Nothing else matters. I know this now. Terrence McKenna died on April 3rd, 2000, just past the cusp of the new millennium. Terrence McKenna was a true visionary and an artist of language. In many ways, he was a prophet, and I know me and others consider him a true legend. It takes immense courage to be the shamanic figure who dedicates their life to the mystery. We need more people in the world like Terence McKenna. He was far from perfect, but so are all of us, and he was extremely inspiring. He was the one who inspired the name of this YouTube channel with his rallying cry to find the others. And I believe many of his ideas are still worth talking about. And I hope that other psychonauts of this new generation can continue to map out the realms of hyperspace that this pioneer laid out for us. I'd like to close with this quote from Terence McKenna that I think says it all. And this is, I think, what the psychedelic experience is broadcasting. It's broadcasting the hologrammatic, fractal, altogether, all at once image of totality that our religions have sensed and called God, and that the shaman have learned to use as a vast kind of computer for extracting information and for generating healing energy. But there's some kind of controlling, minded, integrated thing behind nature. And we're not going to understand it this weekend, next week, or ever. This is not a relationship of solving a problem. It's a relationship of being an initiate of a mystery and then living your life in light of that. And the task of understanding is endless, because understanding is simply the integrated coordination of pattern, and nature is pattern upon pattern upon pattern upon pattern upon level upon level. It is no depth. Its measure cannot be taken. Everything is infinite, and everything is animate, and everything is filled with a kind of deep concern for humanity. If you're interested in more Terrence content, I have a playlist and another video where I'm reacting to his video called A Message for Artists. Please consider subscribing and turning on notifications to support this channel. We also have the Patreon page and the tip jar with the links in the description for that. Thank you so much for everybody who watched this and we'll see each other later. Peace.